here today and don't want to actually do the therapy job. And I, I can't tell you how rare these people are that have uh, the top secret experience, I guess you would say. Sam Darger is our, our speaker today. Grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota in 1989. Graduated from the United States Air Force Academy. And he was a member of the Wing of the Blue Parachute team. Are you a complete lunatic, sir? Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. He flew the B-1, the T-38, the F-117. His combat experience includes Operation Allied Force in 1999. His various military decorations include the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Aerial Achievement Medal. After the military, of course, he uh, had experience with United Airlines from 2000 to 2001. He is now in the private sector working uh, in medical devices sales. He's married for 20, 29 years. Once again, I'm only married for 15, so I've got a user. Three daughters, and I've only got one. And that one keeps me busy, so I can't even imagine. Thank you, Dad, for being here. You and uh, thank you for uh, all that you've done to serve our country. Nice of you to say. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate it. Hopefully, is my mic coming through? Is it loud enough for people in the back or not? Good? Thank you. So Greg did a great job. Um, we got to take all the, the really fun things out of the equation. Thank you, everyone here at the museum. Not to keep on having people raise hands, but anybody here for the first time? I'm not going to do anything. Wow. Well, welcome. Um, if you haven't heard, they talked about it last night while we were here at the gala. One of the top 10 air museums in the United States is uh, ranked by CNN. So a great place to be here today. Greg did a great job starting us off, thanking people that had been in the military. And um, I've got some special guests here today. So I first of all want to say um, thank you. Friends are here today. We'll talk about them a little bit more just in a second. Um, but they've had friends that have come down that are here from South Dakota, military friends that are here. We're in a very rare group of people. He was just talking about self fighter pilots. We actually have one of the leading scientists in the world as it comes to gene editing. Uh, specifically for orphan diseases. His name's Dr. Nathan Jones in the front. Please stand up, Nate, seriously. He does things to really help people. Thank you, Nate. Very good friend of mine, recently moved to San Diego, so it's great to have him up here today. Um, let's get right into the program. Um, we're hoping this is gonna last about an hour. There's only two goals that I have for what we're gonna do here today, and that's hopefully put a smile on your face, and um, hopefully you can learn some things that you maybe didn't know about this airplane or about the Air Force. So uh, real quick, what we're gonna talk about today, I'm gonna give you a little bit more of my background. Greg, thank you for what you said. Um, before I get to my wife, it has been almost 31 years, not 29, so am I okay or not? Okay, I'm good, good. Um, but yeah, so he did a great job of introducing me. I'll talk a little bit about my background and then we'll get into the meat of this program, which is looking at these three topics. Uh, the stealth fighter, why this airplane, if you don't know anything about it, changed everything. And, and I don't say that as hyperbole, it's true. It really changed everything. And every airplane that's coming out today has some concept of stealth that's built into it. And it was because of this airplane and, and what it did back in the day. I'm gonna specifically talk for those of you that might've been here when I did this last year about how we would attack a target. Because I think that's really important, right? It's, we can talk about the concept of stealth, what this airplane did. But when it comes down to it, how we did that, I think, is really, really cool. And then the last thing that I'm going to do is just talk about some interesting things about the airplane. We'll talk about some weird facts that aren't like other airplanes. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about what it's like sitting in that for 13.9 hours. I did that once, and I never want to do that again. Um, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. So as I said, I hope you enjoy your time today. So a little bit about my background, and he touched on it. I will say this, though. So I am the third generation of, of four generations of pilots. I now have a daughter that's in the Air Force. Um, and you can see some of the stats up there. My grandfather, CB in World War II. Uh, my father, who is here today. Dad, where are you? In the back? Are you hiding somewhere? There it is with the red hat. Um, shot down three times in Vietnam. 39 air medals right there. I was asking my father, he turns 80 in July last night, about those air medals, and I think the wrong person's up here talking. He was on active duty for four and a half years with 39 air medals. I was on active duty for 11 years with one. So, <laughs> Dad, next time you do the presentation, all right? 
Yeah, and then I flew it, uh, as Greg said, I, I got to fly some combat missions in the Cell Fighter in 1999. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then I'm very proud, my, uh, my eldest daughter, I have four children, you'll see some pictures here in a minute. Uh, my eldest daughter is just finishing instruction uh, in Oklahoma, and she is a C-17 pilot that was one of the first crews to evacuate Kabul. So a little bit of military in our family. I also have father-in-law, nephews, all that stuff. So big military family. A couple pictures for you guys. There's my grandfather. He's the tall guy in the picture on the left. I didn't get his height too bad. There's my dad. That's what it looks like when you have 39 uh, air medals. You can clap for him. Go ahead. Woo! I will be one. I don't look like that anymore. But when you're 26 and you're in charge of that airplane, you get to smile like that because you feel pretty cool. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to see some embedded videos, but I'm going to pause on this picture for a minute. Those are what used to hang, uh, yeah, in the bomb base right there. So those are 2,000 pound laser guided bombs. They have an eye, the glass part that you see on the front. When they're deployed and when they drop out of the airplane, there's fins that come out in the back. And then what our job was in the cockpit, and we're going to talk about this a lot, was to keep a laser spot on the target. In the last eight seconds, that eye would open up, it would see the spot, and then the fins on the back of the bomb would guide it directly into the target. So um, that is actually before I went out on a combat mission um, back in 1999. And then, just like everything, some people call it the circle of life. This is what my daughter does for a living now. She's getting, uh, or just turned 27, 28. Um, that's her going into Guam. And then that's a picture with two of my other daughters. So uh, very proud of those guys. Uh, he mentioned it, went to the Air Force Academy, uh, 11 years on active duty. He mentioned all the airplanes that I flew. I have roughly 1,000 in the B-1, which was the first airplane that I flew in the Air Force. And then 1,300 in a T-38. Has anyone here ever seen the movie Top Gun? Anyone? <laughs> S yeah, everybody. So uh, the T-38, they were the bad in Top Gun. I have about 1,300 hours in those, 600 hours in a B-1. Quick note on the family. Uh, my wife, Danielle, who's sitting in the front row, I'm not going to embarrass her, um, but she does have a really cool brown hat on today, if you can pick her out. Um, we've been married, uh, it'll be 31 years in June. Um, she comes from a military family. My third daughter, who's standing next to her in that picture, was born while I was flying uh, combat missions in this airplane, so I didn't see her until she was about three months old. That's not unusual for military families, um, but it is really hard on the spouses that stay behind. So, um, Danielle, thank you for the last 30 plus years. Amazing. Um, and that's us. So that's a little family. Yeah, we can clap for military spouses. Come on. So let's get right into it. That's why I'm getting up here a little bit of a background on me. Let's talk about stealth, right? And I, I mentioned at the beginning why this airplane was so important. And it was so important because it was the first, and it truly was. And so what I want to do briefly is just talk about the definition, the talk about the concept and why it was so important. And then maybe if we have airplane aficionados around here, you've heard of this word skunk works. Skunk works was a, a secret division of Lockheed Martin, an aircraft company. And they built some of the most famous airplanes that we've ever seen in the United States, the U-2 spy plane was built by the Skunk Works. Ben Rich led that um, division. He was honored here uh, last night. Uh, they also built the SR-71 Blackbird. And then the Stealth Fighter uh, is also falls under the uh, airplanes that were built there. And then I wrote five things that you should know about stealth. And I know that there's some people here from last year, so if you want to cheat, that's fine. A lot of people think that being stealthy just has to do with the shape of the airplane. Does anybody else have any ideas? You want to call out anything that, that you would have to be concerned about if you truly wanted to be stealthy in an airplane? Go ahead. Thank you. Radar. Radar, yep. So that's the radar cross-section, RCS. That's, that's number one. That's the number one thing that people associate with it. Anybody else have anything? Go ahead. Exhaust. Exhaust. Very good. So heat. So there's two of them. Back. Material. Which one? The material can play into it. We'll talk about the radar, the RAM, the radar absorbent material. Go ahead. Got to be black. Got to be black. That's right, because we only fly at night. <laughs> exactly. And I think we've covered all of them except two. So very good. Very good. You can't just avoid radar. That doesn't make you stealthy. 
I, I haven't read this, but the more and more I thought about it before I came out to present the first time, it has to be these five things because it's why you've never seen another airplane built by another country that looks like this or can do this because if you don't satisfy all five of these things, if you fail in one, you're not stealthy. And so it's important that you have the radar cross-section, the heat, the sight, the sound, and then emissions, which just means the things that might come out of an airplane that would cause a radar or what we call a passive system to be able to detect this airplane in the air. So we're going to touch on all these things briefly. I love this. Last year I didn't have a presentation, so I just did it, you know, standing next to the podium. I looked up the definition of stealth online. And when I, first of all, the first definition is awesome. And then when I saw the second definition, it just made me smile. I mean, that's straight off the internet. That is not edited in any way, right? An aircraft design characteristic consisting of oblique angular construction. So there's the definition of stealth it comes to the Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary. I thought that was really cool. So the concept of stealth. Sonic, uh, particularly today, with some of the things that were going on. Um, you know, uh, a Soviet mathematician came up with this concept of how airplanes work. And if you read that second bullet, it showed that the strength of the radar return isn't dependent on the size, it's dependent on the edge configuration. And I'm gonna show you an example of that in a minute, but when you look at the stealth fighter, it's faceted. And it, that's a word that people use when they talk about like gems. Uh, diamonds and things like that. There is nothing that is curved on the surface of this airplane. And some of the best examples are if you look at the front of the bomb bay doors, the front of the canopy, it has what's called a sawtooth design. One of the reasons that that happened was when this technology was being developed back in the 70s, we didn't have the computing power back then to look at the multiple ways that radar could reflect off of a curved surface. So to solve the issue or the problem of not having that computing power, they said, well, we'll just solve that by making everything a flat surface, an angle. So you won't see a single round thing on the outside of this airplane. In fact, even the pitot tubes, the four things that are covered by the remove before flight, they all had very specific angles on them. So that was all due to the Soviet mathematician. So fast forward, he writes this paper in 1964. Everybody's like, hey, I don't even know what this means. Why is this guy writing it? And then what happens is these brilliant people in Skunk Works find it. And because of what happened in the Vietnam War, and again, we have a lot of Vietnam vets in the crowd. Thank you all for doing the really, really hard stuff. Because of some of our losses, particularly to Soviet SAMs, SAM stand for surface to air missiles. Because of that, because of the Yom Kippur War that happened in 1973 with the Israelis, they said, wow, these SAMs, these, these missile systems, they're so good. We can't get away from them. We can't avoid them. What should we do? And the government said, well, if we could do something to negate the strength of that radar or the advantage that radar can give, then that would be great for our military. And that's how the concept of stealth evolved, right? So in 1975, Lockheed Martin, the Skunk Works, proposed the Hopeless Diamond. And there's a great story, if, if you ever read the, the book Skunk Works, that they built a little tiny model of this. It's like six or eight feet long. They threw it out in the desert, put a radar on it to look, and somebody said, hey, we can't see the model. The radar must not be working. And then as the story goes, a bird landed on the model, and somebody said, hey, we can see a bird. And then they're like, whoa, we can see a bird, but we can't see this shape. And that was a self That was the hopeless diamond. So catch it. They build three or four airplanes about two-thirds the size of this one, and they go out and they fly them. This is the first program where they did this hopeless diamond in 1977. They fly the airplane, and they're like, look, this works. Let's go into full-scale production. They actually crashed a couple of in the process. I mean, if you, you look at the back of the airplane, the tail, this airplane is so different from other play, airplanes, just the way the flaps and everything else work. Its original nickname was the Wobbling Goblin, because when it would fly, it had this really weird shape to our shake where the airplane would vibrate. Because again, when you look at this, uh, and, and they had this in the presentation last night, somebody told Ben Rich, the guy that developed it, that's never going to fly in a million years. And standing here in 2020, having flown in for 600 hours, it doesn't look like it would ever fly in a million years, right? So anyway, they build it. 
we come up with the program, 1981, they start to build the actual production models of this, and I put that point zero zero one meters squared. That was the radar cross-section of this airplane. So a thousandth of a meter, one thousandth of a meter squared, it's tiny on radar, not invisible, but very, very small. And then in 1988, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, the um, Department of Defense comes out and they say, hey, by the way, we have these airplanes. They're called stealth fighters. They show this picture on the news back in the day. That was during the fall of my senior year at the Air Force Academy. So we had developed the airplane and been flying it for eight straight years, 59 of them, and no one had any idea that we had the airplane. Not a clue. Amazing. So let's get into these principles of stealth. And I'll just move through them rapidly because we've talked about them already. But some people are saying things about the radar cross-section, what we have to do with radar. Somebody said material, which RAM stands for radar absorbent material. And then I didn't talk about this the first time I came out, but engines are a really, really big deal when it comes to radar and when it comes to airplanes. So let's look at each of them just quickly. So this concept of having a faceted surface and what that Soviet mathematician said about how radar would, would reflect, if you go back to the day that the stealth fighter was built, or even in the 80s, 90s, even up to 10 years ago, on the outside of the airplane, and even if you look at other ones that are here on the ramp, what did you see? Gas tanks, missiles, all of these things that hung off the bottom of the airplane. I use this picture because I use the example of a mirror. When you look at the bottom of the airplane, it's flat. So the whole concept of stealth in this particular airplane was to deflect radar in a direction that didn't go back to the source. It'd be like if you had something really cool in your car, I speed all the time, and if, if the state troopers would shoot radar at your car and if it somehow reflected it in a different way, that'd be, I should develop that. <laughs> all right, I'm done with this, I gotta get to work. But anyway, that's what this does. So that's 85% of why that airplane's stealthy, is because it reflects the radar energy. The other thing, and some people used to get confused about this. We had a radar absorbent material, I don't know what it was, and it was actually glued, glued onto the outside of the airplane. It was very thin, it was kind of rubbery, it was pliable, and they would glue it on in all different patches. And the reason I put this picture up is this is, and we'll get into this right at the end, this is a very recent picture. So this was retired in 2008. But the Air Force just came out and said, we're still flying them. And now pick, people are taking pictures of them all the time. There aren't very many of them flying, but they are flying. The reason I took this picture is, do you see the white spots kind of on the lower part of the picture? We'll zoom in a little bit more. Those are individual little squares that on this jet have come off. So we'd go out and fly the jet, and we'd come back. And when we'd come back, sometimes there'd be pieces of the skin that were missing from the airplane. But the only reason I, I include it is not to make the concept complicated, but to say that the jet was so special that it would absorb some of the radar that came to the airplane. So about 15% of it because of the RAM, the radar absorbent material, about 85% of the shape. And then this is just something they throw up because it's just so mind boggling to me. So it, it just so happens that the thing that reflects energy on most airplanes the most is the engine, these fan blades that spin. There's, if you're familiar with jet engines, or you can see a lot of them out on the ramp, there's different what they call stages, where the blades get smaller and smaller and smaller to compress the air. That's what reflects. So if I'm a radar controller, I'm sitting in a control tower, and I'm watching your Delta flight or United flight, that's the engine on the left. And the big reflection that I'm seeing on radar is that. The center one's actually an F-15. So a very, very long intake with the engine sitting at the back. Ironically, the first airplane I ever flew, the B-1, had two baffles on the intakes that were set at different angles so that radar energy couldn't make it to the engine and then reflect. One was, one was off by about 90 degrees from the other one. But what they did with the stealth is they put this waffle maker on the front of our intakes to make sure that radar that came in would not reflect off the front of the engine. Well, that looks really cool, right? By the way, you can't fly that in ice because that just would build up so much ice, it would drive you crazy. But they built that, and it's great for stealth, but it's horrible for jet engines, right? Because again, back to the simplistic concept of a jet engine, 
You want to bring as much air into the engine as possible to do that compression and then produce thrust. So that's why these other intakes are so large. But this is one of those things that uh, the Skunk Works was able to do that kept us stealthy. So um, we talked about all three of those concepts, the shape, the ram, and the engine. Let's go on to the next one. And I think somebody brought this one up. The concept of heat. Um, why is it important for the exhaust not to be super visible? Whoever brought that up. Why is that important? Do you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and as important as that is the fact that there are heat-seeking missiles, right? So that airplanes typically have two different kinds of missiles. They either lock on with the radar that's in the airplane that then pushes the missile out under radar control, or they have, they're called sidewinders because the way they move the air, they're heat-seeking missiles that when they're launched from a fighter, they just lock onto a heat source. And if that heat source is intense, and I loved flying that, but this is a great picture because that's four engines and afterburner off of a B-1, a heat-seeking missile can get on that pretty quick. What they did on the stealth fighter is just absolutely amazing is they made what we call the platypus exhaust. So it was very, very thin at the top. And not only was it thin, so it would disperse the heat that was coming out, this whole area right here, very, very thin. But then this white portion that you can see on the back, um, those were shuttle tiles. So they were ceramic tiles. The exhaust was pushed back, so the exhaust was here. There was a lip that stuck, stuck out, and then there were ceramic tiles on the back of the lip. And so from underneath the airplane, there was no heat signature. And in fact, these space shuttle tiles worked so well, they obviously protected the shuttle. But when we would get out of the airplane, you could almost walk back and put your hand up on those tiles and not have any kind of a heat. So again, huge thing, right? If we were using normal engines, we're not stealthy. Or normal exhaust, we're not stealthy, but this airplane was. This is typical. When I was here last year, I said, what color are fighters? And everybody was like, blue, or they're pastels, or they're whatever. Well, of course they are, right? Here's, here's an example of two US fighters, a Russian fighter in the middle. That's what they look like. And this gentleman was so kind to call out the fact that these airplanes, when they're in their pure form or finished, are pure black. Because these were never, ever intended to fly during the day, ever. And so all we did was fly combat missions at night in a stealth fighter. Sound, I didn't even put anything on. So we keep on hearing the noise of these jets taking off. You can imagine what an afterburning airplane, one of these fighters, um, a B-1, huge amounts of noise. The stealth fighter was very quiet because of that exhaust and everything else. And then the last thing is emissions. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. It suffice it to say that anything that comes out of an airplane in today's world in combat, an airplane, is, um, or warfare, is a sad, weird thing, right? Every time you come up with a way to be better than your adversary, they do something to counter that, right? And so the concept of emissions is that if I talk on the radio while I'm in the airplane, somebody can hear that. And they might be able to triangulate or figure out where I am. If I have a radar that's either looking for other airplanes or it's looking for weather, Something's being emitted from my airplane. Again, there can be passive things. The stealth fighter, these two things that I'm pointing at were antennas that stuck out of the airplane. They're called knife antennas. When we did a stealth check to get stealthy before we went into combat, we would pull these antennas in. And for those of you that are sitting here right now, there's actually some holes right in the cockpit. The one that's right above the, it's too bad this isn't a pointer, right above the intake here, that an antenna that came straight out of the airplane this way that we used to land. But the, the whole point of all of this is that we would suck everything in. We could hear on the radios pretty well, not really well, but we could hear pretty well what was going on from AWACS, people you know, giving us threat calls and everything else. But it was really hard for us to broadcast or talk to people because, again, that w we wouldn't have been stealthy if, if we didn't have that ability. So when we look at all five of those things, put them together, that's what made the stealth fighter cool, right? And any of those things, like I said, if you lack them, then you have a problem on your hands. So how are we doing on time, all right? Okay. 
Let's talk about attacking a target. I'm going to load all these quick so we can get through all of this. So notice that I didn't say the most accurate bomber ever delivered in that, in that first bullet. And um, I am a rarity when it comes to self-fighter pilots. So I was a B-1 pilot. I was a bomber pilot. And in the Air Force today, it's not like what you think of in World War II. If you're a bomber pilot, suffice it to say you're a bomber pilot. That's where you fly. If you're a fighter pilot, you fly fighters, tankers, and transports, etc. I was actually in a weird group. There were two of us that were picked to leave the B-1 and go into a single-seat fighter. And so the reason that I don't put the most accurate bomber ever up there is there was a whole thing that happened when the stealth was secret for 18 years. Because right when this airplane came out, they brought the best fighter pilots in the world, and they brought them into a black hangar, and they said, hey, we can't talk to you about what you're going to do. We'll show you this airplane. If you want to fly it, you can say yes and fly it. You can see your family very much, but you can do that because it's secret. And if you say no, then you've never seen this before and you leave. But the big fight was because they were bringing in the best fighter pilots. The story goes that they didn't want, the general in charge of the program didn't want to tell these egotistical fighter pilots that they were going to fly a bomber. So this bomber is called the stealth fighter, but it does one thing, and that's drop bombs, OK? Now, I'm a bomber pilot, so I'm not that egotistical, but it's a bomber. And I'm sorry if my, any of my stealth fighter pilot friends are here. It's a bomber. Anyway, so we were the most accurate bomber ever built. And it's unfortunate, we had a, uh, it, it's fun, in 2022, we, ha we had a little hiccup. I was going to show you a couple of videos of some attacks uh, with the airplane. But again, it, it's not debatable. We were the most accurate thing uh, that had ever been built at the time. Because of our stealth capabilities, we could go places that aluminum jets couldn't go. So our fighter private brethren, whether they're F-16s or F-15s, when we fought in Yugoslavia, their air defenses were so good that all those other airplanes, the normal airplanes, stayed out of Belgrade, their capital. We were the only planes that went downtown every night. We did it for 75 nights in a row. We had two laser-guided bombs. You saw the picture at the beginning where I was standing with them in the bomb bay door. We talked about them a little bit. And then the thing that, uh, you know, a million things that are crazy about the airplane, we were on complete autopilot. So the airplane was, was managing our speed. It was managing our heading. It was managing our altitude. And all we did was we looked at, it was, it was a, a display that would be like a black and white TV. And it came from the FLIR, which is the box for those people in the back that's open right underneath the cockpit. There was a forward-looking infrared, F-L-I-R, forward-looking infrared. And then there was a downward-looking infrared right underneath the nose gear. And our jobs as pilots were to get the airplane in position where we could put on autopilot and then devote all of our time to finding our target and putting that laser spot that we controlled from a joystick that was on our throttles so that we could destroy the target. Automation of the bombs and doors. When that bomb bay door was open, do you think our airplane was stealthy or not stealthy? Not stealthy is the correct answer. So when that would open up, we would look like a B-52. It was hanging down at a 90 degree angle. So what the, the airplane would do is when we would push the pickle switch to drop the bombs, the airplane was so smart that as soon as, if we were dropping both bombs at the same time, as soon as the doors were fully open with no intervention from me, unless, you know, assuming that I had my, my thumb on the switch, the doors would touch, the bombs would release, and in the half second that it took for them to clear the bomb bay doors, the, autom the airplane would automatically close the doors. So the doors would be open for like a fraction of a second. Because in that fraction of a second, we weren't a stealth fighter anymore. We were a 777 or something. We were big. Um, but it was all automated. It was very cool. And what I'm going to do now is just walk you through. This is in color. At first, I tried to change it to black and white to make it look like it looked in 1999, but it made me feel too old, so I left it in color. But this is how we would attack a target. So we would practice every night doing the exact same thing when we weren't in combat, and then, of course, we did it in combat, but we would get three images. We never knew where they came from um, because this is before Google Earth and, and Google Maps and everything else, but they would give us an overview of our target area, then they would give us a medium-sized image, and then they would give us a blow-up. Because the idea was that because we are the most accurate airplane out there, 
We guaranteed people that what we were going to attack, we attacked. Meaning we didn't ever hit the wrong target per se. But this is what it looked like, overview, medium, and blow up. Does anybody recognize this? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is right here. So, so we're, we're actually, I didn't want to make this too easy. Um, oops, uh, I was doing something bad. We are right here. No, yeah, right up in here. But I put this target just down like in a residential area. So we would get an image like this. And as a stealth fighter pilot, we'd look at it. And if I were to look at this, I'd say, oh, this is a really easy target. Because I'm going to see that huge runway, right? We always look for things that were unusual, right? That would stand out in this image that we were looking at in the cockpit. And I would say, well, look, even when I look at this overview, it looks like I'm four or five uh, blocks south of this runway. And it also looks like I have something that's very defined here, this square. And then I have all of this green area down. And so anyway, that would be our overview. Then we would move to a medium. <clears throat> Same thing comes in. I'm looking for things as, as a pilot that are different. So see how the streets all dead end right here into, these, into this line right here? And then see down here we have some unusual roads and then we have this school or office complex, whatever this is. So as we walked into the target, we would have pieces of paper, eight by 10. We would see that overview image. I'd say, yeah, those crosshairs look about right. As we got closer and closer to the target, I'd switch over to this medium. I'd be like, yep, it looks like I'm you know, two blocks left of the, the bottom of this, this office thing. I need to go one block, two blocks, and then I'm going to be up. And I, I didn't do this on purpose, but believe it or not, this green area in between these two houses, that's very unusual compared to all the other houses there. So that when we went to the blow up, and when we would attack targets in the stealth fighter to put this into perspective, we didn't attack a house, we attacked the air conditioning duct on a house. That's how we graded our ourselves. When we flew training missions, sometimes I'd talk to my friends who would fly the mission before me. We would normally have two different goes at night. You know, there'd be a group of eight jets take off at eight o'clock and then a group of eight jets take off at midnight. I'd talk to guys when they'd come in from the first run, I'd say, hey, what, what was the training mission like tonight? And they'd be like, everything's a doghouse. It's gonna be hell. And what that meant was we were actually going after little dog houses in people's backyards. Um, but this is a great example of what we would do. And so the standard that we held ourselves to as stealth fighter pilots is that this, when, we, when we bombed this target, we wouldn't hit this, I hate to keep on saying house, but we wouldn't hit this house, we would hit that air conditioning unit. So again, it's too bad that this, uh, this video doesn't work. This is uh, one of the targets that I struck one night. And this is, this is video footage from what I was seeing in the cockpit that night in Yugoslavia. This is actually a petroleum plant. These are what are called cracking towers. They help with refining petroleum. There's three of them in a row. Um, this looks like it was probably on what's called black hot. We could switch the contrast in the airplane. But the idea, because again, it wasn't color, and we were seeing in the dark, right, with infrared, was to keep these colors as close to different shades of gray as possible. That meant that you were doing a good job with your timing, or your tuning, that you could find very specific things that you were attacking. And then we would hold, what AF stands for is auto fire. So there was a laser up in that flur and then down in the delur. It wasn't visible to the human eye but it, when it was on AF, that meant auto fire, and the, the laser was on, and that bomb would guide to that exact spot. I want to just check to see if it's going to play, but I don't think it is. It's too bad. I think you would have liked it. Nope. So, uh, oh. this was another one. So, uh, I don't want to give my fellow pilot a hard time, but that's not good tuning because that's really black and white. But I put that one up because the other thing that was very specific about the stealth fighter was that in this uh, target attack, we actually had two different airplanes that attacked the same area. And what we would do is sometimes we had three or four airplanes come in and you have different off-access bombs hitting within a second of each other. 
And we always said, because every time a bomb hit, then everybody just starts shooting wildly because they didn't know what was there, particularly in Iraq in 1991. But we always said that if you wanted to screw your friend, but screw really wasn't the right word because it was more like if you want to kill your friend, show up 10 seconds early, right? So your bomb goes off and then everybody starts shooting and the airplanes come in late. So taking all the jumping out of that, we would hit targets at the exact same second. And that was another really amazing thing about the airplane. I think I screwed up my slides here. Let me see what I can do. So let's talk about some interesting things. How much time do we have left? Uh, we got to pick some fun things. I might have to let you guys pick. I, you know what? That's exactly what I'm going to do. So this is like Jeopardy. <laughs> Which one of these things do you want to know about? Somebody call one out. Which one? 13.9 hour flight. Good pick. So here we go. So when we decided that we were going to go to Yugoslavia, stealth fighters back in the 90s, when we would go to an air show, they were roped off and they would have somebody that stood with the airplane, even at night, in a hangar, that stood with the airplane with an M16. That's how protective we were of stealth technology back in the 90s, even from the minute it was born um, in, until we retired. It. And so when we decided that we were going to Yugoslavia, they said, we're not going to stop, or we're going to deploy to Italy. And so at the time, I was the chief instructor pilot in my squadron, and we decided that we were going to launch eight jets, and we were going to fly them nonstop from Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico all the way to Aviano, Italy, in northern Italy. And so I'm going to, hold on real quick, I'm going to break us out of here and get us down to the right stuff. So what we did is the first thing that you do when you find out that you're going to fly for 13.9 hours is you go on what's called the low residual diet. And does anybody want any specifics on that? <laughs> So for the younger people in the audience, a low residual diet means that you don't want to have to go number two. And there's a lot of reasons why you don't want to have to do that. But the cool thing about it, even though people don't like to talk about low residual diets, is the easy way to remember it is if you want low residual, meaning you don't want to go number two, you eat everything that's bad for you. So we ate steak, and we ate donuts, and we ate cheese, and we did all this stuff. We never ate salad um, leading up to the flight, OK? And here's one of the reasons that we did that. So because we we're going to be in an airplane for 13.9 hours, a great circle, so we flew kind of northeast, like out over Maine, up over the North Atlantic, and then curved down into Italy, we had to wear what was called an anti-exposure suit. And the one on the right isn't the exact one, but it's close enough. It was made so that you could eject from the airplane, land in the North Atlantic, and not automatically freeze to death. So that's code for a dry suit. It was custom made for us. It was fit to your neck. It was a rubber. He has rubber sleeves on. And then he has sewn in booties. Because without that, seriously, you would hit the water and you'd literally be dead in, in like 45 seconds. So you'd put on an anti-exposure suit. Then you'd throw in all that other stuff, your vest. We had a um, uh, handgun. We had all these things. And then people are like, well, so what was it like? And I'm like, well, the chair that you're sitting in right there, right now, Put all that on, put on a five-point harness, two, four, and then one in between your legs, and then just sit there for 14 hours. Now you know exactly what it's like. So that's what we did. The cool thing about taking fighters um, and doing that is that you always go with tankers, right? I was talking to a friend of mine this week, and he didn't know that airplanes could refuel other airplanes in the air. Which I don't know why I thought that was funny. I, I guess because I've been in the Air Force since I was, or I was until I was, you know, starting at 18. But so when we took off, there were two tankers, and each tanker had two stealth fighters, right? And then that's how we flew across the Pacific. We switched tankers a couple of different times. The great things about having the tankers is that we were on our own channel. And so when we got bored, we started playing things like Trivial Pursuit, where the tanker would read us a question. And then we would answer, or the other two jets would answer. Because when it was all said and done, we were up for over 25 hours on this particular day, right? From showing up, doing it, and then, and then being done with the mission. So we had a trivial pursuit. And then I didn't want to be inappropriate, so I didn't write pills. But we took gold pills. And they were actually a pill that they stopped using right after Vietnam that was essentially like speed. And it was made to keep you awake, or you could call it no-dose, or whatever you want. We had to test fly these pills 
on the weekends to make sure that we weren't going to get sick or that it was going to be a bad deal. When we got ready to take off, our squadron commander was uh, in one of the four jets, and he said, look, there's going to be a lot of media on the tours. It was a big deal. Um, we didn't talk about this. As great of a weapon of war as a stealth fighter was, after 1991, it became a political weapon. So we would say, hey, we're going to use stealth fighters. And people would be like, whoa, we don't want that to happen. right?" And so we used the stealth fighter as a way to signal to people that we weren't screwing around. So when we took off, we had a whole bunch of media on the tanker. And my squadron commander, Gary Waltering, said, look, I don't want to say, because he wanted us to take these pills on a regular basis to make sure we were all doing the right thing on the way over. And he said, I don't want to say, let's take our go pills. So he said, I'm going to say, let's have some Joe. Like, let's have a cup of coffee. So we're flying over. He says, guys, let's have some Joe. All of a sudden, I hear uh, one of the guys in one of the other airplanes say, hey, I just spilled my Joe. And I'm like, oh, geez. And so this guy had dropped his six or eight pills on the floor of this stealth fighter. And he's all strapped in, right, and all that gear. So there's the end of his pills. So the rest of us take ours. It gets dark. We're refueling continuously, doing all this stuff. We get out over the North Atlantic, and I, I hear that same airplane say, you know what, I'm going to try to get my Joe. I'm like, what, what is this guy doing? And I look out the window. It gets cleared off. And I see this stealth fighter out over the Atlantic just pitch down towards the water. I'm like, what's he doing? And he dives down, and then he pulls up really hard. And as I see him coming back up, he pushes over on the stick, which gives you negative Gs. And then I see him in the cockpit, and I see like his other finger. It looks like he's trying to grab all these things. And he levels out again. I'm like, wow, nice. So somebody says, hey, did you get him? And he's like, no. I'm going to try it again. So he goes ripping down again, and he comes back up. I don't know. We've been flying for like nine hours or something. So I was like, I think I dropped my Joe. I want to do that for a little while. But anyway, we took those pills. Uh, I don't want to make a big deal out of that. I, I don't even know if it changed anything. Um, but that's, that's how we did it. That's how we went over. Um, the other thing that I'll say uh, about anti-exposure suits is they're really cool. The ones we had had a uh, rubber zipper down across your crotch. So if you had to go to the bathroom, um, but our nickname for those in the Air Force were called poopy suits, because if your residual diet didn't work out, that's how you burned off a $3,000 anti-exposure suit. Just <laughs> burn it, throw it away. Um, Greg, do we open up for questions? Do I do one more topic? Uh, you know what? I've got the microphone. I'm doing another topic. You guys pick. We're going to do one more, and then we'll open up for some quick questions and answers. I'll stay for as long as you guys want. Teamwork. Which one? Teamwork. Oh, you want teamwork? That's a great pick. I didn't. Um, I saved this to the end last time, and it was kind of spontaneous. I hadn't planned it. So this is what I tell people about teamwork. So people sometimes have talked to me over the course of my career or in the 20 years plus that I've been on the Air Force, and they say, hey, wow, that's really cool. You know, we never built any two-seat versions of the stealth fighter, so I have a specific number, a bandit number. We kept track. The day I got my bandit number, which was in 1997, so the airplane had been flying since 1981, when they gave me my bandit number, they said, there have been less people in space than have piloted a stealth fighter. And there will be more people this weekend that put on an NFL jersey than have ever flown a stealth fighter in the 16 years that it's been in existence. So it's a small group of people, right? So people always say, oh, you're a stealth fighter pilot, and you got to sit up by yourself and do this crazy thing. That's not even close. And for those people that are here in the military, they know exactly what I'm talking about, and exactly what I'm going to say. You can't do anything in the military without the greatest teamwork in the history of mankind. So uh, yes, let's clap for that. So every night when we stepped out to fly one of these things in combat, it started uh, a day before with people that would plan all these deconflicted routes that we would fly to avoid SAMs and to do things. It would start off with uh, people in the weather talking to us about the weather, if our targets were going to be obscured, if we're going to be able to take off. People would gas them. They'd put munitions on them, very specific, specialized people that would do all these things. 
And it just goes on and on and on. Guys at 4 o'clock in the morning when we'd land that would be cooking us breakfast so that we could eat when we got home. I mean, just millions of people doing that. And then once we got up in the air, eight stealth fighters into Belgrade, we would have uh, multiple AWACs. So these are command and control airplanes that you see here. Wow. That you'd see here. These are F-16s, Wild Weezer CJs, that would shoot missiles that would go after when a radar site would come up and start emitting its radar to see us. They had missiles that would go in and, and take care of that. The center jets in F-15, air to air, these guys are meat eaters. They just fight other airplanes. They were out there to make sure that MiGs didn't come up and try to shoot us down. And then we had our friends from the Navy or the Marine Corps in EA-6B prowlers in the lower right-hand corner. They would fly around on the outside of Belgrade and throw out all of this jamming that would jam communications and everything else. And then to top it all off, we'd either jump on the tanker before or after to get gas. And so to get eight airplanes into Belgrade, we would have uh, 16 or 20 airplanes that were just in support of those. So bottom line, tons and tons of teamwork that goes into not just flying a stealth fighter, but into what every person here in the military did in their careers, and that's go out and um, try to do the best that they can for the United States. So uh, that's because we're clapping a lot, how about a round of applause for teamwork in the military? I love it. The, the last thing that I'll say, and I'll do it in two seconds, is this, and we didn't touch on either one of two topics, but I'm going to touch on them right now. One of the topics that you could have picked from was 1975 to 1988. In 13 years, they planned this airplane. They took it to Congress, not asked to Congress. They took it to government. It was funded. They built all of them in Burbank, California, all 59 of them right outside of LA over here. They put them in the back of airplanes and then flew them up to Tonopah. They flew them. They made them. People made those guys breakfast. We did that for 13 years and no one knew we had the airplane well, that's the most amazing part of the whole thing. it is the most amazing part of the whole thing and the thing that always makes me smile is that if we did that in 1975 I wonder what we're doing right now <laughs> and I like it um, but it, it, it really it really really is incredible and, and if that's the only thing and that was great that you said that Colonel Schreiber but if there's one thing you take Keep in mind, I don't know if it was 10,000 people, I don't know if it was 100,000 people, but it was a ton that touched this airplane. No one had any idea. And then to just make it a little bit cooler, um, I, I talked about it at the beginning, and this is the slide that I'll leave you guys on, so we don't know exactly why, but Air Force Material Command uh, is now flying stealth fighters, even though we were retired in 20, uh, 2008. These are pictures straight off of Instagram. I've become friends with both of these guys. This is a stealth fighter flying against F-15s uh, from the California Air National Guard. And does anybody know what these two little planes are on the left? Anyone? F-35s, the newest fighters we've ever built. So we retired them in 2008, and the government won't say anything other than the fact that we're flying them. But the other thing that they do is they fly them without their radar reflectors on them. So what, what we think, because I'm a civilian now, which is cool, we think that they're using a couple of these airplanes so that our next generation fighters see what it looks like to look at a low observable airplane or to fly them, hopefully against uh, Soviet, other country systems that we've somehow acquired. And so they're using these things again. And so it's, it's a wild life cycle that we retired them in 2008. They made a big deal. A really, really good friend of mine flew the last one up to Tonopah, put them back in the same hangars that they came from. And then all of a sudden, like five, six, eight years goes by, and somebody's like, wow, stealth fighters are flying again. Mm -hmm.